So, welcome here on Saturday morning. I am honored to introduce our special guest, Ro Khanna, representative of the 17th Congressional District. We are fortunate to have a local progressive congressman who is calling for a Green New Deal. This would include a moratorium on fossil fuel um, projects and a transition to renewable energy. All right. Representative Khanna is the first vice chairman of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. He's called for expanding the electric vehicle tax credit with links to domestic manufacturing, Medicare for all, and the prohibition of incineration of toxins. He has repeat, repeatedly pressured California governor and elected officials to lead the way in transition to renewable energy. Representative Khanna has fought to protect access to safe, affordable drinking water and to improve health and safety considerations for all Americans. Please join me in welcoming Representative Khan. Thank you, James, uh, for that introduction and all your great work with the Sierra Club. Thank you, Geetha, for inviting me. It's great to see uh, so many friends here. Uh, Gary Latshaw, I remember uh, having environmental conversations with him, and Hoi Poon, and Nancy Smith, um, Glenn Hendricks uh, for many, many years before I even entered public service. Good to see David Pine, I think I've known since 2004. I am so honored and lucky, I was talking to Ash Cholera earlier, to represent a place like this, where you don't have to lead the constituents, the constituents lead you in terms of the direction for environmental policy. The first thing I want to say is that the Green New Deal is not a radical or new idea. Does anyone know who actually coined the term? Thomas Friedman in 2007, if you go look at a New York Times article, came up with the idea for Green New Deal. And President Obama ran on it. I mean, when uh, he expanded uh, ARPA-E, uh, he had uh, expanded an investment in clean technology. He actually explicitly championed it. And President Clinton, if you look at his book uh, back in 2000, talks about <coughs> five million, the need for five million new green jobs. And one of the uh, folks, Van Jones, I don't know how many folks know Van, I mean, now he's on CNN, but Van Jones got his start in Oakland. And he and uh, Phaedro used to be down in the South Bay Labor Council and a program about green jobs, uh, talking about this back in the 2000s. And President Carter, who I recently had the privilege of seeing, talked about solar energy and energy efficiency back in the 1970s. The reason I go on through the history is that the current New Deal, which I will get into, is important and bold, recognizing the challenges that we face. But it's also rooted in history, and it's rooted in our commitment to pushing, as Democrats and progressives, for a more energy efficient economy. And it's important, in my view, to frame it in that context so that people understand that this is not something radically departing from what we have been working for in a broad coalition. Now, I believe the Green New Deal is about winning the 21st century, economically. China, and I had Secretary Kerry was in front of our committee on House Oversight a few months ago, a couple months ago, and here's what I, uh, and, and Secretary Chuck, Chuck Cagle. Now here was the conversation. China has 50% of the electric vehicle market today, 50%. 50% of the electric vehicle production is taking place in China. We have about 1%. I was in San Jose with Tom Pike, my district director, and we saw an electric vehicle manufacturer, and I said, where are you selling to? He said, we're shipping it to China. So China is going to be at 40% renewable energy, 40% solar and wind by 2000. 25. We're going to be at about 18% on the current trajectory. China 
has a plan to put $500 billion in massive solar and wind investments in solar farms and wind farms. Now, when in, in the Soviet Union in 1957 launched Sputnik, America didn't just say, oh, who cares? We'll let the Soviets have the lead in the space race. There was no American who thought that. We said, no, there's a future technology. We want to lead. Does anyone want to concede that the future energy industry should not be American? I mean, even if you don't understand the existential threat that climate change poses, even if you haven't read the Intergovernmental climate Panel of Climate Change Report and understand that you know, we have to prevent the temperature from rising beyond 2 degrees and bring it down to 1.6 degrees and all that they recommend, even if you don't want to get into the understanding of climate science, surely you can agree that America should lead the world in 21st century technology and energy. Surely you wouldn't want to create a China or another nation that becomes the dominant supplier of the world's future en energy. Now, what investments are we really talking about? Because you keep hearing these absurd numbers. How many folks have heard this number of, well, the Green New Deal costs $93 trillion? Is it? I mean, I don't understand where they're getting these numbers. I, I, I really don't understand it. The, uh, because the reality is, if you made, we, and I was working with a Stanford professor, uh, who at Stanford, fortunately, they have a, the best environmental research uh, 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 program there. And if you do something as simple as making the electric vehicle tax credit fully refundable, and at the point of purchase, and you expand it beyond the 200,000 cap, you could actually transition in this country with the declining prices of lithium ion batteries, as all of uh, us know, you could transition to within 10 years to getting at least to 50% of vehicles being electric. Now here's the question. When GM is shutting down its plants in Ohio, how many folks heard of all those GM plant closures? And the president thinks that tweeting out to insult the GM CEO is going to bring those jobs back. So far, none of those jobs have come back. I mean, every couple months he says, okay, let me send an insulting CEO tweet to the CEO of GM, as if she doesn't have any other things to do with uh, her obligations and is suddenly going to create those jobs. And then he says, okay, let's put all these tariffs on China. Still don't see any of those jobs coming back. By the way, just a slight this digression on the tariffs in China. Uh, Apple, which is of course uh, very near uh, our, uh, uh, near us and in my district, uh, guess how much they buy from domestic manufacturers uh, around the nation? Any, any guesses? $60 billion Apple spends on domestic manufacturers around the country. Uh, that's more than the GDP of Montana. The reason I know this, we have a governor of Montana running for president. But the, uh, the, the Apple, Apple in just the domestic manufacturing, the amount it buys, is more than the GDP of many of our states. And so the president's putting all these tariffs. It's not doing much to create manufacturing jobs. If anything, it's making it harder in global supply chains and hurting a number of manufacturers. But now think of this. What if we actually extended the electric vehicle tax credit, if we actually understood why GM laid off those workers in Ohio. They laid them off because people are buying SUVs instead of sedans. That's just the uh, reality of the consumer marketplace. And what if we said now we're going to extend electric vehicle tax credits for SUVs, and by the way, it's going to be right when you buy them. I guarantee you, having spoken to people at GM and others, they would retool those plants to make electric SUVs. It would be good for the environment. It would be good for our competitiveness, and it would create jobs. That, in a nutshell, is the Green New Deal. It's not some fanciful concept. It's not uh, makeshift work or non-productive work. It is saying that what built America, the fundamental bargain in this country, was that we would have 
federal government strategic investment cooperating with research universities, cooperating with the private sector to spawn new industries and new jobs. That's what we did in the 50s and 60s. That's how we won the Cold War. We had very little funding in science and technology after Sputnik, and we increased funding of GDP in science and technology. We mobilized science and technology from 0.7% of our GDP to almost 3.2% of our GDP. And that spawned whole new industries that put us way ahead in computing, in GPS, in information technology, in gene therapy that allowed America to succeed. And now our research and development funding is back down to under 1%. Under 1%. That's not how we're going to win the 21st century. And I think this message about linking the Green New Deal with the green energy race, about linking policies that are good for our environment with policies that are going to be good for our country, is one that can resonate not just among people who see the need to tackle climate change, but can resonate in every part of this country that is anxious about the future of our economy. The reality of our economy was captured, and President Carter has been on my mind recently because of his fall and uh, incredible resilience. I mean, can you imagine he uh, broke his hip, 94 years old, and I read today that he's uh, going to be teaching Sunday school tomorrow. Uh, a, a remarkable uh, sense of commitment. And he had a, I had gone to see him uh, in uh, a month and a half ago because he liked some of the work I was doing on North Korea. And I said to him, Mr. President, uh, China hasn't been in a war since 1979. He says, Ro, I know, I normalize relations with China. And I let him speak. And he said, which he subsequently repeated in a conversation with President Trump. President Trump called him and said, you know, I'm concerned that China is getting ahead. And President Carter said to him, well, China has not been in war externally since 1979. We've spent trillions of dollars of war, 40 conflicts since 1979. Imagine what we could have done with those resources. 18,000 miles of high-speed rail in China, 500 miles of high-speed rail in the United States. For one year's cost of war in Afghanistan, $40 billion, you could hook up the entire country to high-speed internet. For the increase in our overseas contingency fund, $80 billion increase for overseas contingency fund. That's Washington speak for a slush fund for future wars. That's actually, you can look it up. I couldn't get, on my, I offered an amendment to freeze defense spending to 2018 levels at $717 billion. That's about $150 billion more than President Obama's defense budgets. I said, let's just freeze defense at the 2018 levels that Trump had them at. I got seven votes out of 26. I couldn't get the majority of Democrats to agree to freezing defense spending at 2018 levels. For $80 billion increase that we're having for future war slush fund, $163 billion total in this overseas contingency fund, which could be used to make war in Iran or Venezuela or any other part of the world, for $80 billion you could have free public college tuition in the entire country. I'm perplexed when people ask, how do we pay for some of these things? I think it's not how you pay for it. It's what do you really think is going to make us advance us in the 21st century? For $200 billion, you could create solar farms and wind farms that would dramatically increase and exceed the Chinese standards in terms of percent of renewable energy. California, we, you are leading the way. All of us, 60% goal by 2030. You know, it's still the most successful economy of any country, uh, any state in the country. 1.7 trillion dollars, 15% of 
of our GDP. Growth rate is faster than Texas. I looked that up when Ted Cruz kept taking shots about California. I said, let's we just look up the statistics. And yet we are leading in showing that solar and wind and, 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 and a renewable energy future is actually good economics. So I believe that your work at this point in our country's history couldn't be more important. It's important because of all of the increasing awareness of the costs of climate change. We've seen the wildfires here, we've seen the devastating impacts in places like Florida. I'm headed to Nebraska to look at the flooding there, and I, I'm headed there for a particular reason. I met someone there, Jane Cleve, who chairs the local Democratic Party, and she said, Ro, no presidential candidate for the Democrats have go has gone to Nebraska. You've got to, you've got to come here and st start, start telling presidential candidates to come here so that people, we realize that climate change is not a coastal issue. It's an issue that affects every part of this country. It's an issue that's a, that is, that as you all understand, is devastating to farmers, it's devastating in the heartland, it's devastating on the coast. So you all are champions of this and, and, and the energy of young people, of all of the new brilliant members of Congress and energetic and passionate members of Congress, climate change is on the top of their mind. But I would say, that we need one final and additional step, which is to convince people that climate change is not just an issue about the survival of our planet, that climate change is not just an issue about making sure that we're preventing extraordinary disasters, but that whoever wins the clean energy race, whoever creates these new technologies, is going to lead the 21st century when it comes to the economic future. And that at a time of automation, and at a time where jobs and deindustrialization are taking place, we need to bring invest in these new industries to create new jobs across this country. That is my hope and my work uh, to make that case uh, for the economic vision of clean technology policies. Uh, I've been very excited to partner with so many people uh, here, and I look forward uh, to having the Bay Area and our vision and your work uh, be a model uh, for the country when it comes to the Green New Deal. Thank you very much. <laughs>